أحمده وأصلي على رسول الكريم أما بعد فقال عز وجل يمحك الله الربا ويربي الصدقات رب اشرح لي صدري ويسل لي أمري وأهل الأقدة من لساني يفكه قولي آمين يا رب So the one the 16th largest bank of the country just collapsed. The Silicon Valley Bank just collapsed. Along with it, in the last five days, two other banks have already fallen. Maybe more are to follow. This is inevitable in a system based upon riba. You know, this bank did not fall because they were dishonest. No. They, this bank didn't fall because of uh, uh, what they were claiming in 2007 with the banking crisis, the housing crisis that happened, and with the collapse of the banks that happened at that time. It didn't happen because of greed or because of playing with wrong rules. No, it didn't happen because of that. It happened because of the rise of the interest rates. I will discuss this in, in some detail in just a little bit. When you find out exactly what happened and what caused the coll collapse, I mean, the bank was fine three months ago, six months ago, a year ago, two, three weeks ago, but then the Fed raised its interest rates and boom, Collapse with the bank. Collapse with the bank. The bank couldn't take it. And I'll let one of the people explain that in just a short while. The second thing I want to mention that is extremely important is that it puts, you see, for someone to invest in a place, like why, why do people invest in America? Why do people invest in America? And, and this bank is specifically about venture capital funding okay this is not like the common man's bank i mean they had only two percent of people that had less than one hundred fifty thousand dollars. there was one lady that was a business owner that lost 10 million dollars in this and as you know the fed only guarantees 150 250 thousand dollars so you know all that venture capital money well we don't know what's going to happen exactly at the end of the day <clears throat> but it's going to come out of someone's pocket and so you have uh, this, uh, uh, so when people are in any land, when they want to start a new business, they want to start a, a new venture, right? Uh, what, do you, what do you need in that place? You need a place that's secure, a place you can trust. You can't do business in a place you can't trust. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this in Surah Quraysh. بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لإلافي قريش إلافي مرحلة الشتاء والسيف فليعبدوا رب هذا البيت الذي أتعامهم من جوع وآمنهم من خوف. You must have a place of security. You must have a place that is secure, where your money is secure, your wealth is secure, your life is secure. If you live in a place where your uh, life is not secure and your property is not secure, you can't do business there. You can't travel safely there. You can't put all your hard work in a place that there's no stability in. The Quran informs this in other places too. What does Ibrahim والسلام, pray for Mecca? That baldatan aminatan, that make this a land that is peace and secure. And uh, then he prays for rizq to come to that place. So this you know, a land that's secure is what people need to do business and to have risk. Okay, so I can't go into the details of that right now, but I'm only mentioning a principle that uh, you think there's going to be a $10 billion investor who's going to be thinking now that, oh, let me invest my money in the United States of America after this huge, huge, colossal collapse. It's a bigger collapse than they're even saying. It's a bigger collapse than what happened in 2007. It's a bigger collapse. I'll tell you why. Because this was the cream of the crop getting wiped out. Okay. This was a bank that was an expert bank at, at understanding the technological uh, aspects of business. Okay. And it would fund those venture like Ruk, Ruko, that business that is popular, Ruko. Right. They lost their money in this. So, <coughs> uh, so if they're not going to invest in America. Well, nobody really wants to invest in Europe. Europe's going through a war with Russia. Who knows what's going to happen? They have an energy crisis. Uh, nobody wants to invest in China because China has its own debt and its own problems. 
who wants to invest in the Middle East? Hmm. I wonder, would India be a good option? Maybe for labor, maybe for some technology, but n no one's going to put their headquarters of research and development uh, in where? In, in, in India, okay? Uh, I mean, there may be some things, but, you know, uh, India is the next big bubble like China, okay? So China has reached its peak and now it's coming down. China, India is coming up. And that will be a temporary thing, too. India has its own problems and its own crisis and its own issues. So, where will people invest? Not in America. And not in Silicon Valley. You'll see just in a second. I'm going to show you. So, they're not going to invest in Europe. They're definitely not going to invest in Russia. They're not going to invest in China. They're not going to invest in, in India. It's not the best place, right? So where will they invest? Hmm. Has there been another Silicon Valley that recently came on the news called Silicon Wadi in Israel? Hmm. I wonder if the collapse of Silicon Valley has anything to do with Silicon Wadi. Let me... Before I show you about Silicon Valley and the research and development companies in Israel right now, because Israel is the biggest startup venture capitalist co country in the world right now, if I think. It's like in the top list. It has the most startup companies in any other country in the world. Trust me, I have been keeping my eye on Beitul Maqdas. So, now let me tell you about the collapse of this bank because of Riba. So let's get started with that. 1982, and they quickly became a prominent lender throughout Silicon Valley while catering almost exclusively to venture capital. Essentially, this became the startups bank where CEOs and businesses would go for funding. And for the last several decades, that worked out incredibly well until recently, and you're going to want to follow along. In 2020, when interest rates were reduced to zero and stimulus measures were put in place, both banks and people were flush with cash, and almost all of that funneled back into the banking system, which is where things began to go wrong. See, banks currently operate on what's called fractional reserve banking. This means that banks are required to keep at least 10% of their customers' money available at all times for withdrawals. Just imagine it like this. You give me your $1,000 to hold on to for safekeeping, but I could turn around and give 900 of that to somebody else who could give $810 to somebody else who could give $700. $129 to somebody else. Under this situation, banks hope that enough people give them $1,000 deposits so that when the first person wants their money back, they'll have enough cash on hand to process that withdrawal. The benefit to doing this is that this allows their customers access to a much larger pool of money and they're able to earn interest on their deposits. But that also relies on everyone having faith that the system works and not all pulling their money out at the exact same time, which has started to happen. Now, to be fair, in most cases, banks aren't lending to other banks who lend to other banks who lend to other banks. Instead, banks often take your money, loan out a portion of it, and invest the rest in really, really safe and stable investments like U.S. Treasuries. This ensures that as long as those treasuries are held to maturity, the bank gets a nearly guaranteed rate of return, customers can be made whole, and everyone wins. Ex that's another haram aspect, which is to guarantee a return, which the government does on its bonds, okay? So, uh, no matter, the majority of the money is put into these types of uh, places. Except in this case, and here's why. In 2021 and early 2022, Silicon Valley Bank took roughly $100 billion and invested that into government-backed bonds, with a significant portion of that locked away for three to four years at an interest rate of just 1.79%. Essentially, this meant that Silicon Valley Bank took a massive bet that the Federal Reserve was not going to raise interest rates as fast as they did. And when they turned out to be wrong, that put them in a very dangerous position. See, bonds like this are valued based on their yield, and in this case, Silicon Valley Bank was on the wrong side of the transaction to lose a lot of money. 
Just imagine it like this. As an example, Silicon Valley Bank took $100 and bought a 2% interest rate for four years. As long as they could hold it for the full four years, they'll receive $108.24 back and be paid in full, no problem whatsoever. But what would happen if interest rates suddenly increased right after you made your investment and all of a sudden you could buy that exact same $100 at a 7% return and make $131 over those exact same four years? Well, in that case, your $100 2% bond would have to decline to $77 to be worth what you could buy at today's prices. And if you can't afford to hold out for the full four years to get your money back, you're going to be forced to take a loss. And that's what's starting to happen. Now, normally, banks would have enough capital coming in from a variety of sources to cover customer withdrawals. But in this case, Silicon Valley Bank's customer... If it wasn't a bank, this would be known as a Ponzi scheme. I'll tell you what a Ponzi scheme is. A Ponzi scheme is that you are surviving because more and more investors are bringing in money and you're using the money of the investors, the new investors, to pay the old investors. Okay, So you're using the new money to pay the old people and this is what's keeping you afloat. The modern banking system cannot keep afloat without this Ponzi scheme. This is why they try to get banks try to get new customers, right? And so they're trying to get new customers so that they can pay the whatever that they need to pay. And then they want to take 90% of your money and loan it out to other businesses or put it in other investments. So they're only required to have 10% of your actual money uh, in the banking system. It doesn't even have to be in that branch or that bank. Um, <coughs> okay, so let's now continue customer base are mainly technology companies which have seen significantly less funding and that means that their companies are forced to take more money out of the bank to pay for their own expenses essentially silicon valley banks severely misjudged the size and pace of the federal reserve's rate hikes while assuming that the venture capital market would continue to stay strong that left them in a situation where they locked too much of their money away in one specific asset that yielded too low of a return and that occurred at the exact same time their customers began with drawing more money than they anticipated. This, of course, is where the dominoes begin to fall. On Wednesday, March 8th, the company announced that they would be selling off. And what has happened here at the local level can very, very easily happen at the grand scale. A third of their ownership in an effort to raise $2.25 billion. This was done in response to them being forced to take a $1.5 billion loss on a portion of their bond position, which was done to bring enough money back to the bank to be able to continue processing withdrawals. The problem, however, came on March 9th when word got out that the company could potentially be facing insolvency issues. And as a result, their stock price plummeted more than 60%, making it unlikely that the company would be able to raise additional capital to help plug the loss. At that point, the entire situation devolved into a full-scale panic. It was reported that their CEO had been calling clients to assure them that their money with the bank is safe, while well, startup founders had been advised to pull their money out as soon as possible, just in case. But overnight, things got even worse. On the morning of March 10th, Silicon Valley Bank announced that they had failed to raise capital and instead were looking for a buyer, meaning they quite literally ran out of money, had more withdrawals than they had cash on hand, and were looking for anyone who could potentially take him over. Unfortunately, though, that seems like too little too late, because just a few hours after that, Silicon Valley Bank was shut down and closed by regulators with the message that all of the bank's deposits have been transferred to the new bank. Of course, you might be thinking to yourself, FDIC insurance exists for a reason, and they should be able to recover up to $250,000 almost immediately. Except, uh, yeah, that's another problem. Here's the thing, as most of you know, anytime you make a deposit within a bank, you're protected by what's called FDIC insurance, which protects up to the first $250,000 you have deposited in the event of a bank failure. This was created after the bank runs the 1920s Great Depression as a way to incentivize people to retrust the banking system, and it largely worked. Since then, FDIC insurance has continued to evolve for any bank who wants to legally operate in the United States, and the good news is that it's a fairly efficient system. In fact, their website says that you could get access to your money within a few days after the bank's closing. However, in this case, the bad news is that, as Genevieve from Grit Capital points out, only 2.7% of Silicon Valley's bank deposits are less than $250,000, meaning 97.3% of their money is not FDIC insured. And it's not clear... I think that's enough for that. 
Before we continue on some really interesting points, especially when we look at uh, what Biden will say in just a little bit, I want to change the topic just for a little bit and tell you this narration of the Prophet Sallallahu the pro and I'm just I'm not going to do the Arabic today. I'm just going to do the English, so it's easy. So when you see in Mecca holes or channels that have been dug out in another narration inside the mountains, and you see buildings surpass the top of mountains, then know the command of the hour. Now, what's the Arabic word for the hour? Anybody know? Sa the hour. What is the Arabic word for a watch? Sa right. So the Prophet said that when you see these tall buildings over Mecca, then know that the command of the hour has already cast its shadow over you. So the, cast, the shadow is on me and you already for the day of judgment. But here's one interesting thing that as I was thinking about this narration, and it's, there are three other narrations that say this same exact point, and that is that isn't it interesting that the building right over mecca the third largest building in the world taller than its mountains is a clock what do you call a clock in arabic sa what does the sa mean in quran it means the hour hmm maybe somebody should think about that maybe somebody should wake up if you can't wake up with that, then what will wake you up? This is why the shadow has been overcast and the time for the countdown has begun. Things are getting bad in the United States even. And now, what do you do? Well, that's what I really wanted to talk about. After I talk about the problem, then there's no use talking about a problem without giving a solution. So, let us continue looking at the issues around what has just happened, and then we will talk about the solution also. The fall of Silicon Valley Bank in just 48 hours is the second biggest bank collapse in U.S. history, and it sent shockwaves from Silicon Valley to Wall Street to Main Street. SVB was known as a tech lender and held more than $200 billion in assets. It was hit by a bank run and a capital crisis, as well as rapid rising interest rates. Concern is growing over the stability of what was a tech-focused lender in the valley. Uh, many called it the backbone of Silicon Valley. It lost nearly $2 billion. The fall of Silicon Valley Bank in just 48 hours is the second biggest bank collapse in U.S. history, and it sent shockwaves from Silicon Valley to Wall Street to Main Street. SVB was known as a tech lender and held more than $200 billion in assets. It was hit by a bank run and a capital crisis, as well as rapid rising interest rates. The failure sent bank stocks plummeting. Customers withdrew a whopping $42 billion in deposits by the end of Thursday. In Massachusetts, customers were turned away from accessing their cash and were told to come back on Monday. Deposit so it's such a big deal that I think trading right now has been halted in the stock market for some time. <clears throat> but let's now listen to Biden. And how he was, you know, you, you understand that Biden's a puppet, right? So, I mean, he's he's going to come and say, oh, no, the banking system is all fine and there's no problems. And, you know, I got my team to take care of all problems and we're good to go. So you'll see this uh, in Biden saying this right now. Your deposits will be there when you need them. Small businesses across the country, the deposit accounts at these banks can breathe in two days. Americans can have confidence. Today, thanks to the quick action of my administration over the past few days, Americans can have confidence that the banking system is safe. America's going to have confidence. <laughs> SubhanAllah. Okay. You know, that's an interesting punchline. Your deposits will be there when you need them. Small businesses across the country, the deposit accounts at these banks can breathe easier knowing they'll be able to pay their workers and pay their bills. Notice how he says small businesses, meaning less than 250,000. And the hardworking employees can breathe easier as well. Last week, when we learned of the problems of the banks and the impact they could have on jobs of small businesses and the banking system overall. Banking system overall. I instructed my team to act quickly to protect these interests. They've done that. They've done that. On Friday, 
the government regulator in charge, the FDIC, took control of Silicon Valley Bank's assets. And over the weekend, it took control of Signature Bank's assets. Treasury Secretary Yellen and a team of banking regulators have taken action, immediate action. And here are the highlights. First, all customers... No need to go into that, but... Uh, you get the point, right? This was such a big deal that they have to get the president to come out and say something about this. Well, it is a big deal. And uh, he he should have come out and said something about that because it would create panic otherwise. And uh, But what's the real lesson here? The real lesson here is يَمْحَكُ riba. Allah will destroy riba. فَعْزَنُوا Know it. That Allah and His Messenger have declared war against riba, against those who indulge in this industry, Muslim or non-Muslim, <coughs> because the rule is Allah yamhakullahu riba. Allah will destroy and blot out the system of riba. So, if Allah and His Messenger at, are at war. They are at war with those entities that are rebelling against Allah and His Messenger. Sounding the alarm bell about what happens to the book value of banks when rates get get high. Just what are you, what are your thoughts? They're talking about interest rates here, and this is actually a very important discussion. And even if it's boring, it's worth going through to get even the little bit of gems that you can get through it. Um, <clears throat> I'm just going to let them talk. And uh, and if you get parts of it, that's great. If you don't, that's okay. This is a little bit more technical conversation. Um, but uh, I'll put, uh, we'll do parts of this, okay? So they're talking about interest rates and what's happening and how the domino effect will uh, take place. And they're also talking about quantitative easing, which is also has to do with interest rates, okay? Well, no, real bank analysts like Dick Beauvais or... You know, Mike Mayo, they understand rising rates cause book value to go down. And when rates rise a lot, as we just saw with Silicon Valley Bank, then you have market risk. And that market risk has turned into credit risk, and the bank had to be taken over. And this all goes to the feet of Jerome Powell and the members of the Federal Open Market Committee, because they did this. There's nothing wrong with that bank. There was nothing wrong with Silicon Valley Bank six months ago, three months ago. And now they're dead. And by the way, shareholders lose everything. Creditors of the hold co may lose everything because they took over the bank. So that means the parent holding company, Silicon Valley Group, which is what most investors uh, know, uh, is no more. So that the chart that we're showing, I think, is from uh, yesterday of the stock going from you know six hundred a year ago to around thirty dollars. Is it confirmed? You know, now that's been taken over by the FDIC, is is that a zero? I don't know that it's necessarily a zero. There may be some recovery for the creditors. I don't think for equity, though. There's rarely any recovery for equity in a failed bank holding company. You know, the vendors are lucky to get paid. The FDIC, remember, the waterfall with a bank is different. They will pursue repayment for all depositors, whether they're insured or not. And they will pursue third parties. They are a receiver, just like a receiver in a federal court. And so they have broad investigative powers. But when you see them setting up a bridge bank, this new bank they set up this afternoon, that means they didn't have time to sell the bank. They literally had to stand up a, a new bank with a new balance sheet, and they convey all of the assets into that vehicle that they either want to protect or, you know, eventually sell. And then the remainder stays in the old, old, you know, the old bank, the estate of the bank. And all claims, everything gets killed in the receivership. So. And uh, so are all depositors going to be made whole? I know there's a, yeah. a yeah. officially, okay, so yeah, officially uh, only up to a quarter million, 250. So I'm going to forward some of this because it's not that important. What's maybe more important is going to be some of this discussion that's going to happen here. And there is a T account there that shows you the progress of the receivership. The larger depositors don't want the blowback predators. No. And I think if you're an equity holder of the bank, you are probably looking at a dead loss. Nothing wrong with this bank. This bank failed because they didn't fully understand the implications of the 
Fed's actions, especially quantitative tightening. And quantitative tightening has to do with interest. Now, you know, a good bank is gone. It, this shows you the, the downside of quantitative easing, the destruction that the Fed's record. Quantitative easing, again, has to do with interest rates, specifically when the banks are closed. Plus, and insensitive <laughs> policies are causing. The Fed should have known that when you concentrate all of the risk in the banking sector and the bond market into three points in terms of coupons on securities and loans, and then you move the market 600 basis points in terms of interest rates, you're obviously going to have a problem. A first-year banking associate can figure this out without a calculator, you know? But the Fed governors don't seem to understand these things, so we're paying the price for that. Right, and... For folks who say, oh, a bank failed, I know what happened. They made bad loans. People couldn't no. pay back those loans. No. no, yeah, that is not that was happened. What what exactly happened here? What were the assets that were owned and why were they so impacted by a uh, rising interest rate? Why is the true culprit interest rate risk here and not credit risk? Because they owed a bunch of securities, Jack, that had zero risk weights. Under Basel II, a Ginny May has a zero risk weight. Fannie Freddie's 20%, so you, you put the minimus capital down. But the, the move in the markets, the move in prices for fixed income instruments as a result of the Fed's actions essentially rendered the bank insolvent. There was a piece on Silicon Valley Bank in the FT, and even before that, this was three, four weeks ago, the short sellers had identified Silicon Valley Bank as an outlier in terms of the size of their securities portfolio versus the total balance sheet, and they could see the unrealized loss. They could see what was happening because of interest rates. So they just started selling the sh uh, shares short, and the fear built up. You have a lot of early-stage companies that bank with this bank, and they were afraid to leave their money there, so they pulled the money out, and the bank collapses. It's just like the 1930s, okay? There's no difference. The only difference is the Fed has caused this problem because they are not sufficiently tuned in to the financial markets. You know, after 2008, the Federal Reserve Board basically emasculated the Fed of New York, destroyed all their surveillance capabilities, and took everything to Washington. This is the result, Jack. Okay? How do you think the Federal Reserve is feeling right now? The members of the FOMC, how Confused, worried about this are they? Terrified. Uh, you know, if this turns into a major banking contagion next uh, next week, Jack, uh, Jerome Powell's going to have to resign. Uh, and other members of the board may have to resign, too, because this is a fundamental mistake. They have misjudged the impact of their actions on the real world. And the implications when you have messed up the real world politically are rather severe. You know, we have a president who's looking to, to gain re-election. He's not going to appreciate this if we have a bank crisis next week. And by the way, let's forget about rising interest rates. I think next Monday, Fed's going to have to drop interest rates 50 bips, and they're going to have to open the discount window and just say, guys, we're here to take any collateral you have, and we're not going to look at the coupon. Okay? No haircut. They have to do things like that to get ahead of this. Otherwise, we're going to have a problem, Jack, even at current interest rates. Forget about raising interest rates. Even if we leave rates where they are, the banking industry has still got a solvency problem. And, and explain how the dominoes fall. I feel like for, for... This is an extremely important statement he just made. The, I mean, I don't know if, how many people caught this, but this is... It's like one sentence that cuts through the whole system. The banking industry has a solvency problem. That means that the banking industry is not making money, it's losing money. They can't pay their debts. Or they're not getting money from whom they are lending money. So there's a, pro a debt problem. Which is interesting because interest-based systems are debt-based systems. Credit, it's easier to understand. You know, I lend money to you, you lend money to someone else. If I default to you, you're going to default on someone else. The, the dominoes start falling. But right. where are the interlinkages, in, interlinkages? Where is the contagion if, you know, Bank A owns a bunch of long-duration treasuries and, and mortgage-backed securities that have declined in value that they're not realizing? Well, they're in trouble. How does that affect it? Let me tell you. This is – I'll tell you how – let me answer his question my way. 
most banks would probably hold the same assets that this big bank was holding. And so if those assets lost value for this bank, those same assets would then have lost a, a value for all the other banks where that were holding American treasuries and American bonds as their assets. And, and that is actually, uh, if you're looking at it from that perspective, that is very, very scary. Another bank that has the exact same holdings. Yeah. Well, let me tell you a story. Uh, once upon a time, there was this crypto bank called Silvergate, and Silvergate was closed. Silvergate was a tiny bank. It had formerly been involved in the mortgage industry, so I knew a lot of the people there. They all lost their jobs, by the way. And so this little pebble goes rolling down the hill. But it was enough to start getting risk-sensitive investors to start worrying about their bank. Then you have a bank like Silicon Valley, which is already being attacked by the short sellers because they've made a mistake in terms of buying all of these zero-risk Fannie, Freddie, Ginny securities, which are now trading in the 70s. Okay, 70s. So we just had this bank go down. We have First Republic under attack by the short sellers. So banks that have vulnerability here are going to be attacked by the shorts. If the Fed doesn't stand up and indicate to the market that we are going to address the problem, the problem will get worse. Because ultimately, Jack, it's... Which is what they try to do by bringing Biden into the picture. But actually, in reality, people, uh, it, it doesn't get it doesn't get better except for short term. About people worrying about having access to their money. And if you have to become a contingent creditor of the FDIC, well, they try. Anyway, so I think this was only to show you the, the depth of the problem within the system and the depth of the problem interest rates can create. Just as interest rate hikes created a problem for this bank because, and because all the other banks are sh are investing in the same treasury bonds that means that they may not have had all of their assets there maybe they were more diversified right but anyone that was investing in the treasury bonds which is very very common uh hardly any bank would have not have done that uh and and anyone that would have done that is in loss today for that particular investment so this is where the banking system is in the, in the U.S. So the point here is that, of course, the system, the banking system is going to collapse. The prophet, I mean, the Quran says so. And so what do we do now? <clears throat> you must invest in gold and silver, real money, the money of our Islamic law the money of Qur'an, the money of the Muslims, the early Muslims, the money that actually has intrinsic value. You must invest in that. You must invest in and you must have cash at home. So if there's a collapse, well, you'll need some cash. You can't have all your cash in the bank. That's going to be a catastrophe if something happens like this bank just collapsed in overnight and you can't get your money back and so you know you gotta keep some cash at home or somewhere hidden you have to do that and you have to invest in gold and silver in commodities in uh in things that will hold value when the whole system has finally collapsed because it's going to collapse. Why? Because they're doing something against against what Allah has taught every single people of the book. Okay, and now it's reaching a peak, and now that same system is being used to crash it from within. So, it's very very important that you take this seriously, and you take the sign seriously, and you take the sa'a that's over Mecca clock that's over Mecca, the hour. You take that very seriously. It's very important that we understand that the end of times have already arrived. The end of times have already arrived. 
I mean, you, if you know, I wish I can go into details about this, but you know, there's a hadith that, that indicates, that indicates World War I. There's a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ that indicates Saddam Hussein. There's a, there's a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ that indicates, uh, what was this guy that got a whole bunch of secrets from the NSA? I forget his name, right? Epstein, right? Or something like this. Uh, the, uh, the Snowden, Snowden. Right? Snowden. Edward Snowden, sorry. That was the one. Yeah, Edward Snowden, who got all these secrets. There's a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ on that. So, and, 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 you know, it's a matter of interpretation, but it definitely fits. You know, there's narration, there's narrations that seem to fit with COVID, for example. And these are the end of time narrations that seem to be fitting in just as clearly as the clock tower with the hour, the hour, the sa'a, the sa'a over Mecca, right? Uh, it's like before the horn blows, I'm letting you know that it, time is up, the countdown has begun. And so I have a link for Sunnah currency uh, at the end. Uh, I mean, in the comment section, I will have a link to that. So those of you that want to go by, money that is beautiful that's representative of islam that is of the same weight as in the time of umar bin khattab radiyallahu an that currency that sim that it will be good luck for you because of the symbol and what it re represents and with the intention it was made and then there will be a video at the end of this also on a opportunity you have to participate in a Ramadan program that we have for our projects in our masjid with a uh, good launch, I think it's called. You'll see the link in the comment section, inshallah. So I want to end with this. Look, you must understand that riba, riba is a problem. The riba system is a problem. An economic system based upon debt. An economic system based upon uh, debt and then on the side of the banks it's based upon what? No risk. You know, Why? Because in business there's risk. The bank takes no risk. If you don't give the bank what it wants it'll take your house or your car or whatever you have. The bank has no risk. So it's very very important and inshallah one day if Allah wills I'll be talking in great detail about riba a lot of detail about riba but it's very important for you all to see this as a sign muslims in america and then muslims in the west specifically see this as a sign that they need to start getting ready they need to start putting their caches in you need to put your cash in your house you can't put all of it in the bank you can't and you can't trust the system okay this is one of the problems the, uh, one of the signs of the Day of Judgment, that you'll trust those things that should not be trusted. And what are the things we trust most? One of the things that we trust the most is the banking system. But the banking system is going to collapse. And if you're not prepared, well, if you're a Muslim, you should be prepared. You should be prepared because the Prophet told us. The Prophet is trying to save you from losing all your assets when everything finally collapses. So, please go to the Sunnah Currency site and buy those. They look more expensive, obviously, because, you know, they're our own design and our own uh, weight and everything. So, it's a little bit more. But it's definitely, definitely, when you buy it and put it in your hands, you're going to feel like it was worth it, inshallah ta'ala. You'll see that. You know, just buy a few in the beginning and before you do the big order, just buy a few and then you'll see, inshallah. You'll see. You'll love it. And you'll buy, want to buy more and more. So, don't trust this riba system. Don't trust paper money. It has no value. Okay? Don't trust this system. Don't put all your money in uh, the banks. Put some of it at home. Okay? Put a large percentage of it at home that you can survive on the cash at your home if there if there was a collapse. You can at least get somewhere safe with you and your family and that you're able to eat 
and then buy things that are going to actually have value, you know, and uh, maybe I'll do a video on that one day too, things that you can buy that will have value. Uh, so, uh, like one of the things that will have value, uh, you know, is, is going to be like uh, fruits, dried fruits, dates, for example, okay, and many other things like that. So, <clears throat> inshallah ta'ala, I will uh, end here. And hopefully, please share this with other people. And uh, uh, and so that other people can also be aware that they need to get ready for this collapse. Now, uh, I will end by... This is also a perfect setup to create a situation where the people who are the Zionists, uh, people of who claim to be associated with Bani Israel, the Yahud, that they then will be leaving this country which is what they uh, part of the plans that they have so bismillah rahman rahim ramadan is coming and so i want to offer uh, all of uh, my subscribers my listeners my students <coughs> a chance to participate in something really amazing as you know we have a very amazing community where we are we are in a place where there's about a three to five mile radius of of dominantly Muslims and particularly in that Jami Masjid plays a central role the Masjid that we're part of and of course we're getting ready for Akhiru Zaman uh, and so that doesn't come for free um, so let me share with you uh, some of the activities that we've been doing some of the da'wah work we've been doing hopefully inshallah ta'ala you will uh, appreciate what we're doing and then I have something to request from you So inshallah, this is the opportunity we have. You can turn your $30, $1 a day in Ramadan into $130 because LaunchGood is offering us that for anyone who gives us $1 a day, $1 a day in, during the month of Ramadan, they'll make it into $130 for us. So LaunchGood is matching $100 for every donor who signs up for their daily Ramadan giving challenge. Just sign up to donate $1 per day to give fun to to our fundraiser and launch good will give us an automatic a hundred dollars there's no uh you know catch so you go to the link that'll be on the comment section or the description which will be launchgood.com slash team jammy buffalo okay and then you press on the white button which i'm going to show you and you sign in uh, the amount it literally takes two minutes to do the whole process and that's it your $30 donation will net us an extra hundred dollars so you're 
getting a lot more because you're helping uh, us get the re uh, the the finance in this world, but you will reap the benefit in this world as well as the next world. Now, let me just show you. This is the LaunchGood website. Uh, when you click on our link, it'll take you to this page. Okay, and over here, you can kind of see the uh, people that just signed up. Okay, these are some of the people uh, that just signed up. 359 joined today, alhamdulillah. Uh, we're competing against some of the bigger organizations and some of the bigger well-known speakers. But you can schedule your giving by clicking on this white uh, area here. And you can put set your amount for $1 for every $30 it's going to be $130. You can bring this down to $1 a day during the month of Ramadan. Okay. And you click next. And uh, <clears throat> and so please definitely do that. Okay. So please do that. The other thing I want to say is that uh, we're a very active community. If you are someone who's serious, has a family, who's worried about Akhir zaman and wants a, to be in a masjid that's strong in da'wah, strong on helping the youth, as you saw from the video. If you're someone who wants to be a, in a place where you can study the deen on a daily basis, if you want to be in a place that's getting ready for akhir zaman then definitely consider moving to our community in Buffalo. <clears throat> so, with that, I will end. Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.